as we get into the Word today, uh, the story of us, we want to talk about the creation of God. And, and as us as part of creation, we talked about a little bit about biblical anthropology and, and who we are, how God fashioned, in, uh, fashioned us, and the purpose and design God had for us. Um, and um, I told you about the trip earlier uh, in, in, with, with my son. And, and because it was a, a chance, I, I, it was only a, a travel voucher, so it was a chance passenger. Um, going back Sunday morning, I took the red eye flight. And so it was about 2.15 when I got there, 2.30 when I got there because the flight was about uh, 5.30. So I needed to be there three hours early to secure a, a seat. And so I got there, and, but the flight was overbooked, overbooked by one passenger. Right? And so I said, uh oh, I, I'm not sure. I wasn't sure if I was going to make it to, uh, to get to Singapore on Sunday morning. And so I, I started praying. I texted my wife, but of course, you know, it was 2 30 a.m., so she was uh, fast asleep. And so I was praying and asking, Lord, please give me a seat. Lord, help me. And so uh, I got there and I, I lined up on, I'm sorry, on the other side. I lined up on the counter and I said, uh, can, can I, uh, you know, get in the flight? And she said, Sir, we're overbooked by one. Could you come back for 30, 45 minutes before the flight? We'll see if you have a, a, a seat. And so I said, ah. So I kept praying. And I went, here's what I did. I went to the other side, the other counter, to the other, ex, uh, other end, and see if I could sneak in and, and get a, a seat, right? And so I asked, can you, you know, can you secure a seat for me? And she said, sir, uh, come back for 30. Same response well, at least they're consistent right and so i and then i went back and they gave me this blue slip or white or blue slip uh, I, i'm on the wait list right and so it said they're number two <gasps> number two all right overbook na nga ng isa tapos i'm not even number one i'm number two because i came very early and so i got that slip and so I was wondering who that number one was. Okay, I was going to bribe him or, you know, do whatever I can. Uh, or say, I'll pray for you diba? to get on to the next flight. Okay, I'm a pastor. Okay, so I, whatever it took, okay, I was about to do. And I went back um, to that counter around 3.30. All right. And uh, she said, sir, 4.30. Okay, so I, I went back. 4.15, okay, same response, sir, 4.30, okay, I was makulit, right? And so, but uh, I had that slip, and so I 4.15, I waited, right? And then I saw another guy beside me who had a similar blue slip. I looked, okay, and I said, boss, uh, what number, okay? He was number two. I was number two, okay? So he had number two, and who, where, where was number one, right? And so like, Hi, you're number two. I'm number two also. Okay, so now my, you know, my boxing out skills started to come out, right? The competitive spirit. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here. For, I was here 2.15. What time did you come? Okay, and so I was asking him. And so I, I got there. And so uh, long story short, all right, uh, we got to the line. And when, I, when we got to the line, I brought my, my passport out right away. Okay, here's my passport. Okay, and so number one wasn't there. So here I put... Praise God, 25 did not show up, okay? There was a 25 no-show, so there was enough room, okay? I made it in. Thank you, Lord. Okay? And so, it was so... But you know, there was a moment when I kept coming back 3.30, uh, 4, 4, 4 o'clock, 4.15. I was feeling a bit hopeless because it was early in the morning. I was tired. I was exhausted. I drove up from Tagaytay and back. And then I, I, you know, I was there early, as I said, and then... And then I was number two. And then there was another number two, right? And so I was feeling hopeless. And, and thank God, uh, you know, the Lord, the Lord pulled through. I, talk about, I want to talk about hopelessness for a bit, okay? Um, obviously, what I went through, at least that season of hopelessness at that time, is trivial compared to some, right? And to what others go through. And so I want to talk about this because it's a, it's a major issue. It's a concern today. Okay? Why is hopelessness a major issue today? It's always been an issue, but more so today. And that's what I want to be able to answer. Why is this such a prevailing um, concern these days? And there are many different causes of hopelessness, and I've listed a few. There's a lot more than these, though. But there's a lot of disconnection that's happening we're uh, super connected via technology, and yet we feel so disconnected. 
uh, the relationships are not as vibrant as compared to, you know, uh, even if they're social media. Unas unanswered, unanswered questions that we have, eh, which would be, I don't know, why did my mom die when I was, when, when I was 19 and she was only 45 years old? I still don't have an answer to that. Why did my brother-in-law die uh, of cancer? We prayed for him and the church prayed for him. Why? All these different questions, right? It could spur hopelessness. Disappointments. The Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. Um, unkindness. The world today is pretty unkind. You can easily be a meme in a day, right? And so somebody can just, you know, where, where, uh, a keyboard warrior can start talking about you online. It can go viral and you're, you can get very de devastated. Dysfunctional relationships. There is a lot of brokenness in friendships and relationships today. I don't have to explain this to you. You know this. Um, fear, okay? rejection, abandonment, failure. Some of these things that somehow it creeps upon us and, and there's just a, a fear of people might reject me or, or, or will this person leave me or what if this doesn't happen? My, the plans I've laid out does not actually pan out the way I had wished it would pan out. A lot of these fears, purposelessness. We, 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 we wake up in the morning and we wonder, why am I alive again? Why am I doing the do? Uh, uh, why am I going to this job again or this workplace? Or why do I have this business again? Traumatic events like, you know, deaths and abuse, series of defeats. It's like, it seems like I can't get a victory or life seems to be out of control. A lot of these different things can cause hopelessness. And when, they, and when it's consistent, when that hopelessness feeling stays and it's just consistently there, how many of you know can call, it can cause emotional pain? It's a lot of emotional pain. And that's why you wonder why people either, you know, they, they hurt themselves and they cut themselves, right? It's like you're already in pain and you're cutting yourself. Well, listen, I was listening to a, a seminar a couple of weeks ago. It's called Digital Cocaine about just the dangers and the addictions of of, of technology. And so he was just explaining, he's a neuroscientist, he was explaining that, you know, when, when you are, let's say, exercising, uh, when you run or when you carry weights, there's micro tears that happen to your muscles. And when there are micro tears, the, uh, your body releases dopamine and endorphins. Endorphins is the happy more, ho sorry, the dopamine is the happy hormone. Those are the neurotransmitters. And then the the endorphins, that's the natural painkillers of our body. And so what happens is, you know, when there's muscle tear exercise, that's why when you run and when you exercise, it makes you feel good, right? But here's the thing, when, you, when there's pain, all right, it also releases endorphins and dopamine. And so that's why a person who's feeling hopeless or feeling low or anxious, uh, causes himself or brings that to himself, brings pain. So endorphins and, and um, uh, dopamine's released. Okay? This is what the neuroscientist was explaining. And so again, these are, this is prevail, prevailing today. Okay? And, and that's what we want to, so we want to talk about. What does the Bible have to say about this? Now, Pastor Patrick beautifully explained Genesis chapter 3 last week. That he said that our sin is the ultimate cause for our hopelessness. That at the risk of sounding simplistic, this is at the core the reason for our hopelessness. All right? Our relationship with God was broken. And when, once our relationship with God is broken, everything else breaks down. Our relationship with other people, our relationship with creation itself, our relationship with culture and society, everything else breaks down as a result of the brokenness of our relationship with God. But we are not left without hope. The Bible says God has given us hope. Where then can we find this hope? How then can we have this hope in this life? That's what we want to answer today. Okay? Because when we look at the world, as I said, it, it's, we know it's broken. I don't have to explain to you and you don't have to be a, riot, a rocket scientist to know that the world around us is broken. You check your Twitter feed, you check your Facebook feed, you know that there's stuff going out there and it is, uh, it is, it is hard to watch these things that happen. Even Paul himself said in Romans chapter 7, Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? 
I am so broken, who will save me? He said, thanks be to God uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ who has the ability to bring me victory and who can save me. Now, what is God's plan of redemption? How does he bring this hope to you and to me? And let's talk about that for a moment. I want to talk about the covenant. I want to talk about the cost. And I want to talk about the consummation of this redemption. And so this will be in Genesis chapter 3. And then we'll jump a little bit uh, to the New Testament and talk a bit about eschatology. And so the covenant of redemption. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between you, uh, your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is God speaking to the serpent, okay? Satan in the form of a serpent. And this would be, as many scholars would say, as the proto-evangelium. Proto meaning first, evangelium gospel. The first gospel that was preached even in the Old Testament. And so now he, he, he gives a messianic promise. You are not left without hope you are going to be given redemption and ultimately restoration he said i will put enmity between you and the woman and between the offspring your offspring and hers now god says your offspring and hers take note of that because normally like even in the new american standard version it uses the word the seed your seed and the seed of the woman Oftentimes, when you talk about the seed, it's usually, uh, it refers to a male patriarch, the, sale of, uh, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Jacob, the seed of Israel. Here, it talks about the seed of the woman, which actually foretells and says that the Messiah was going to come out of a virgin birth. It was something that was a foretelling of what was to come, that the messianic, this messianic prophecy is saying the prediction that the miraculous conception of, uh, of uh, and, uh, the coming of Christ through miraculous, miraculous conception. Right? Now, he said, God said, you will strike his heel. Serpent or Satan will strike or bruise, as the ESV version says, bruise the heel of this Messiah. And which pertains and suggests that something was not ultimate or final. That while it looks like, he seemingly looks like he was going to be defeated in Calvary, but three days later, he was going to rise from the dead. And then he says, he will crush your head. That this Messiah will be bruised or seemingly be defeated as he rises from the dead. He wins over the enemy. And now he will crush the head of the enemy. He, he will be ultimately the victor. You see, Christ's death and resurrection guarantees our redemption. You might have heard of the statement, firstborn of many, that Jesus was the firstborn of many. What does that mean? He's the first installment of what is to come. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he inaugurates the new creation. Creation was... Uh, was uh, the, the planet, earth, all of creation was built perfectly at the beginning. And then sin came, corruption started. But God is about to restore creation to its original intent and design. Jesus inaugurates that new creation when he rose from the dead. Right? What does that tell us? That in this life, you can see vestiges of victory. That you can have victory even now. Not just in the life to come, but even now. That you and I, as we have experienced the redemption of Christ through faith in Him, by His work in Calvary, we can stand and say, Lord, thank you for that victory. It is finished. And that your sins have been washed away. Some of us need to hear that today. Because you are struggling with guilt and your conscience is is, is, is uh, uh, nagging because of the pain of sin. Listen, today you can be set free from that. His death and resurrection can guarantee redemption. Let's talk about the cost. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. 
of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I don't know if it was an apple or mango, okay? Uh, but whatever that was, okay? The Bible doesn't say it's an apple, right? The Bible says their eyes were opened. And they knew that they were naked. Knew, the word know that there was used there, they perceived, they realized, they recognized, they, uh, they noticed, they observed. And they were, when they were created, they were created naked and unashamed. Today, or sorry, that time when, when they ate the fruit, they, were, uh, they realized that they were naked and they were filled with shame. You know what? That, that's what sin does. Sin brings shame. And there's a need for us to cover ourselves. And that's why when, we, when there's sin, we hide ourselves. And, and that's why sometimes we feel, I don't know, Lord, if I even, I'm worth going to church. Or I don't even, you know, I don't, I don't feel like going to church or I don't uh, deserve going to church. Listen, when you have failed and when you have fallen, all the more you need to go to God. That's the condemnation of the enemy that pushes you away from God. The conviction of the Spirit of God pulls you to the presence of God. All the more we need to go. And so the cost of redemption, what's the cost? You see, they sowed fig leaves to cover themselves up. Now, how many of you know fig leaves don't last very long? They dry up. They tear. Okay? And, and soon enough, they won't really cover. But God had a solution. The Bible says in verse 21, God made garments of skin. Where did God get skin? Where did he get that? You, you have to wonder. You have to ask yourself. Okay? Apparently, this was the first death in the garden. God had to kill an animal to cover them with skin. Now, this was horrific for Adam and Eve because Adam named each of the animals, the cre creation of God, right? Started uh, every, li uh, every living creature, he, cre he, he named them, every single one of them. And then now he's counting, it's like, that particular animal is no longer there. Or maybe he saw what happened. The reason why I am clothed and I'm covered today is because somebody had to die. The reason why you and I are covered today is because somebody died in Calvary. And that shame and our sin has been taken away because of Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was a substitutionary sacrifice. We should have paid for our own debt, but somebody paid. He owed a debt, or we owed a debt we couldn't pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. You know, there was a, there's a classic, it's called Tale of Two Cities. Um, there's two characters, Charles Darnay and, and Sidney Carton. And they both love the same woman named Lucy. And so, you know, Parang siguro, parang movie, no? They, they, they were uh, pursuing both. Uh, both of them were pursuing uh, the same girl. And, and at the end, Lucy chooses Charles, who was a French aristocrat. This was during the French Revolution in the 1800s. And so now, unfortunately though, because of the French Revolution, uh, uh, Charles was thrown into prison. Uh, long story short, he was sentenced to be executed by guillotine. And so, uh, they, you know, they, they got married, they, have, they, they, they had children, and then, uh, but he was sentenced into prison uh, to be executed. But here's what Sidney did. Sidney goes and visits Charles, okay? The guy who did not win the pursuit to Lucy, right? And so Sidney goes and, and says, uh, Charles, you have a wife and a, and, and a child. Why don't we switch places? that I take your place in the prison and you be with your wife and son or and child. And of course, Charles says, I cannot do that. Okay, I will not let you do that. And somehow, long story short, he knocks him out and then uh, uh, forces, uh, actually, he, 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 he knocks him out and then the friends of Sydney, you know, uh, brings him out, they switch clothings, and so he was able to get out. The next day, 
Now, of course, Sydney is now already inside, okay? And starts talking to the other inmates. One of the sim, uh, seamstress, another lady going to be executed by guillotine, talks to him and says, you know, Charles, okay? Thinking that he was still Charles. Charles, this and this. Do you remember our conversation about this? Of course, Sydney doesn't remember any conversation, right? Because that's not him. And so now, he says, uh, the girl realizes this is not Charles. This was somebody else. And her eyes become wide open. It's like big, her eyes turn big. It's like, are you dying for him? And he says, be quiet. Yes, he has a wife and a child. I'm taking his place. And so of course now, it's like she is overwhelmed by how can one man do this? And this is what she said. She said, stranger, I have been feeling I'm not going to be able to face my death. But could I hold your hand? Because if someone as brave as loving and as loving as you held my hand, I think I'll be okay. He was not even dying for her. He was dying for Charles. But you see, for you and for me, somebody died on our behalf, somebody as brave, somebody as loving. His name is Jesus Christ. See, today, the cost of our redemption was so steep, yet God thought you were worth it. Pastor Mark, uh, one of our pastors uh, here in the front row, he's our, one of our discipleship pastors here, leads up our discipleship ministry, was telling us the story of his hard drive. Um, his hard drive, this one right here, he took a picture of it. His hard drive um, is a normal, regular Seagate hard drive. Um, it would cost you about, you know, uh, $100, right? Uh, or 5,000 pesos. But, uh, but this particular one is about $700, okay? You have to wonder why. It's the same terabytes and all that. Apparently, what happened was um, when uh, somehow this hard drive fell and all the pictures inside was lost, seemingly lost. And so they, he had to send this, uh, th this hard drive or the old hard drive to Seagate and said, could you restore? And so I guess it's the uh, super tedious work. Uh, so I had to pay extra uh, and then shipping and, and the new uh, hard drive. This was the new hard drive. Um, and so now he had to pay extra and he had to believe God okay, for, for, for that provision. Uh, why? Because 13 years of photos, his wedding, okay, the first baby, second baby, third baby, okay, and all his kids' birthdays was in this hard drive. Okay? And why did he pay a steep amount of price? Because it was worth it. It was worth paying because it was of a value to him. And it wasn't, he was telling me earlier, he said, I didn't feel bad that I had to pay that amount of money. In fact, I was happy when I saw the pictures because I am so glad it's restored. See the same thing with God. When he paid the price, a smile on his face says, now I can be restored and our, our relationship can be restored and he can be, they can be reconciled back to the relationship with me. Finally, and let's end with this one, consummation of redemption. The completion of this redemption plan of God. In chapter 3, you'll notice towards the end of, of, of chapter 3, God said, Adam and Eve Sorry, I can't let you stay in the garden. I have to make you leave. There's a reason for that. Not because he was angry, but because he said he does not want them to eat the tree of life. Thereby, if they eat from the tree of life, they will remain in that state for all of eternity. God does not want us to stay in a sinful state. He had a plan to bring us and restore us back to our original purpose, intent, and design. Revelation 21, and I'll fast forward towards the end of the Bible, okay? Usually when we read Revelation, we're scared about the Antichrist 666 and all that, right? Okay, but it's, listen, that, that, that was a, those symbols were really uh, addressing the seven churches in Revelation. But ultimately in the end, what, it, what he was trying to achieve or what he's trying to uh, address was there was creation, 
that was corrupted by sin, but there's going to be a restoration. And this is the hope. This is called the living hope that we have. In fact, verse 2, the Bible says, verse 1, uh, when I saw, then I saw the heaven and a new, a new heaven and a new earth. The, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. In fact, this earth that we have, this will be renewed. Okay? The sea was no more. Verse 2, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And at the key there is the heaven comes down and meets with planet earth, and it's a renewed state. The corruption is no longer there. The dying of the leaves and, the, and all that is all gone. The pollution is no longer there. It's a healed, rewoven, renewed creation. That is what, we're, what we have to look forward to. The, the creation and the, the, the environment that we long to have, we will have. And the earth that we had wished we have, we will have in the future. That's the, that's the hope that we have. Verse 3. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be with his people and God himself will be with them as their God. You see now the completion and the consummation of that restoration. That the brokenness in the relationship, our relationship with God has been fully restored. And now our once the, once the relationship with Him has been fully restored, everything else is restored. Our relationship with fellow men, our relationship with all of creation. Okay? Now, verse 4, the Bible says, He will wipe away every tear. You know, that's a, that's a powerful picture when we get to heaven. But there will be no more crying, no more mourning, no more death, no more pain. The former things have passed away. NIV says the old order of things have gone. No longer there. And there's going to be a renewed creation. Okay? This is our living hope. No more death. No more sickness. No more pain. The old order of things have passed away. Um, there was a, a lady. Her name is, uh, there is a lady. Her name is uh, Joni Erickson Tada. You might have heard of her. Uh, she dove in the Chesapeake Bay one time as a young lady, but misjudging the shallowness of the bay and hit her head and broke her spine and caused her to be a quadriplegic for all her life. And so that's been the, the situation. And, and, and she, because of that spine breaking, she had to you know, be on a wheelchair. She's paralyzed from neck down. Can't use her hands, can't, can't move. And so... Um, this is what she said in her book. She said, hardships are God's way of helping me get my mind on the hereafter, meaning the things to come. I don't mean hereafter as a death wish or an escape from reality. That's not what I'm talking about, she says. I mean the hereafter as the true reality. This is not reality. This is not the true reality. The true reality is about to come, she says. And nothing beats rehearsing a few time-honored scriptures if you want to put reality into a heavenly perspective. Like every time my corset digs in my side, I guess it's like the binder that she has that digs in her side uh, to keep her up, upright. Like every time my corset digs in my side or I'm forced with a four-week four week stint in bed, I look beyond the negatives and see the positives. She says, because you know, there was a time... She, you know, because she says, somebody has to brush her teeth. Somebody has to do things for her. And there was one time that, that you know, the, uh, she was waiting for somebody, the, the person who, to brush her teeth, right? And so the, the, the water's been turned on, okay? And she closed her eyes and she said, Lord, one day I'm going to get to use my hands. That's the hope that we have. And then furthermore, she says, I recall that pilgrims aren't supposed to feel at home on earth. I set my heart and mind on things above and dream of the day I will see my bridegroom, Jesus. I remember the promise of a new body, a new heart, and a new mind. And I think about the crowns I'll be able to cast at Jesus' feet. These things make up the soon and coming reality. This is the true reality. So today, get your mind on the hereafter. Listen to that last line. The soul that mounts up to heaven's kingdom cannot fail to triumph. 
Joni Erickson Dada. That's the hope that we have. You know, for her, it's physical things. For some of us, it's other different, many different things. My, my mom, as a single, as a solo parent, struggled with loneliness, struggled with, you know, challenges in life as a single parent. But now she's with Christ. She's passed away a few um, years ago. But now all that, the old order of things are now gone. Children born with autism or with disability, time will come. They'll be able to walk. They'll be able to think straight. They'll be able to do whatever God has designed them, their bodies to do. Pain, trauma of people who've gone through sexual abuse or, or, or molestation. Just the pain of that, the old order of things will soon be gone. That's the hope that we have. Shame because of our own folly and of our sin. The Bible says all that will be gone. Rejection that haunts us day in and day out. The fear of failure, the fear of ab abandonment. All that, the old order of things will soon be gone. Wesley Hill, I mentioned him before, was one who uh, uh, struggled with homosexual, he still is struggling with homosexual acts. And so he said, you know what? He wrote a book, Washed and Waiting. He said, I have been washed by the blood of Jesus, but as Romans chapter 8, I'm waiting for the revelation of the sons of God to be revealed, that my body will be changed into new, that the old order of things will now be gone. Behold, the new things have come. Verse 5, he who was seated on the throne, Jesus, King Jesus, says, Behold, I am making all things new. I am making all things. You know, this, I don't know about you, but this resonates with my heart so much. And I'm sure it does with you guys. It resonates with all of our hearts. That's why we could face so much suffering, even with hope. You know what? Um, John, who wrote this at the Isle of Patmos, was actually addressing an audience who was going through persecution. That time, Emperor Domitian spread a, 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 just a, a lot of persecution. They were being fed to the lions in the arena, Roman arena, as an entertainment. They were uh, being burned at the stake. They were being buried alive. All these different things because they were following Jesus Christ. And, but as Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs became the seed of the church. The more the church was persecuted, the more they grew. You know why? Because they had this hope. How can you kill somebody who will not die? How can you snuff out the hope of somebody who has an eternal, everlasting hope? How can you snuff that out? That's why the way we live now is controlled by what we believe about our future. What we believe now, okay, or what, the way we live now is, is controlled by what we believe about our future. If you, and there was a story about these two guys who um, were thrown into the dungeon, thrown into prison. This was a, during a, a war. This is a, a, I guess it's a parable or an anecdote. Thrown into war. The first guy lost his children and lost his wife. The second guy, his wife was still alive and his children were still alive and was, uh, told him, I'll wait for you even if it takes 10 years, we'll meet at some meeting point. The first guy, after a couple of years, curled up and died because there was nothing to look forward to. The second guy continued to live in hope because in 10 years, I'm going to see my wife and children. That's what spells the difference. What hope do you have today? Because if the hope that you have today is just to have a nice career and to have a nice home and to be married with children, I don't know if that's enough. But if we live life today knowing that the eternal living hope is with us through Christ, then that is something to live for each and every day. Amen? Can we bow our heads? I'm going to ask our, our, 
our worship team to come up and we're going to sing one song together. Lord, I thank you, Father, for, Lord, the hope that we have in Christ. Lord, we said a mouthful today, but Lord, I pray that you'd help us hold on to these truths, wrap our brains around it, and to bring application to life. Let's all stand as we close. Please stay for a moment, and we want to, I want us to sing this song, and just even the third and the fourth verse, because this song is so powerful. We sang this earlier. It is only in Christ alone that we have this hope. Let's sing this song, and I'll close in prayer. is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of a man can never block me from his hand till he returns Calls me home here in the power of Christ. I'll stand. Oh, 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 oh. let's all lift up our hands right now. Oh, 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 oh. challenges today number one don't let go of the hope that we have in Christ don't give up don't quit this race his grace is sufficient don't quit you have a hope it's a dying hope it's a living hope stay the course okay second one continue to spur one another with this hope Find friends, find people, find relationships, connect with somebody, find a small group, find uh, a group that you can connect with. If you are in a group, keep doing that. Just spur them on. When they were being thrown into the lion's den, they were together. They were holding each other and saying, soon and very soon, we're going to see our king. That's the hope. How do you kill a guy who can't die? Who won't be snuffed out? And finally, share this hope. Uh, share this hope to one, okay, to one a person who needs it, okay, to somebody who needs it. 
And so I just want to pray for us as we uh, be released and be uh, to leave today. Lord, I just pray for us, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would um, remind us of this hope that we have in Christ. Thank you. The Lord, you died. You didn't remain dead. You were raised from the dead. And because of that, death no longer has its victory. Lord, let us not give up this hope. Lord, those of, Lord, if there are any of those here in this room who are about to let go, Father, I pray that you would hold on to them, that you would remind them that your grace is sufficient, that they would stay the course. Lord, one day we're going to see you face to face. One day the challenges that we face will no longer be there. One day injustice will be gone. One day the old order of things will pass away. Lord, some of us, Lord, we need to look for people we can stand with and spur one another in this hope, Lord. And I pray for, Lord, Lord, if, if we're not in a group, Lord, help us connect our, us, Lord, to be connected with relationships, with friends and people from, with spiritual family. Lord, to some of us, Lord, we need to encourage another, inspire another person from the office or in the, uh, in the campus, in our schools, to inspire them with this hope. This life isn't all that there is. There's something to look forward to. And so, Lord, I pray as we leave, let your righteousness, peace, and joy, and your hope be with us. Thank you that you are the anchor of our hope, Jesus. We stand on your name and in your name alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.